All right, and we're live. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, this is No Capes, um, and today I have Mike Van Riel on. Say hi. Hello, everybody. Hello, Kayla. <laughs> is it Kayla or Kyla, actually? It's Kayla. Yeah. Um, cool. So, for anyone who doesn't know, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, well, 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 wow. Uh, I think most people probably know me as the, one of the lead developers on PHP Documenter. I've been working on the project for a couple of years now and been in contact with quite some people. But aside from my work on PHP Documenter, I also work for a company called Inga Wigald, which is a complicated name to pronounce, but that's actually what it really means. <laughs> So, yeah, I've been working with Stephen Copas for a couple of years now, and I've been active with PHP for, I think, since 2002. So, a fair amount of time. Yeah, so let's, uh, you mentioned PHP Documenter. Let's talk about that a little bit, because that's a, a pretty large package that's in um, pretty good use by a lot of people. Um, so, what has been your experience with running a large open source package? Oh, wow. Um, you actually get overwhelmed when you are leading such a project. The things you encounter, everything from support requests to uh, people who want to interface with your application, uh, people who tr request that you extract specific packages from them, it's so multifaceted that I, it's barely hard to speak about one little thing from the project. Uh, most of all, my resume would be politics. You're continuously talking to people and uh, see what they want, see what you want, uh, and support people. It's mainly pe about people, actually. OK, so um, I, I understand that a little bit. I, I, you know, I run OmniPay for the for the PHP League, and it was my first big open source package that I had. And um, yeah, there's a lot that goes into maintaining a package, and PHP Documenter is even larger, so I can only imagine that. Um, but you weren't the original author of PHP Documenter. Um, I think you said you took over like eight or so years ago. Um, True. So how did that come about? Um, you know, taking over a package that somebody else wrote. Um, actually, there was a little bit of a history involved. Uh, the original PHP Documenter project started somewhere in 1999. Uh, in PHP terms, that's ages ago. And I was currently at work with an internet service provider in the Netherlands. And I wanted to use PHP Documenter. But this project that we were working on was, I think, 2 million lines of code combined with uh, something in the order of magnitude of 300 separate models. And basically, PHP Documenter, the original one, uh, took forever to run. Uh, not to mention that they used such large amounts of memory that I couldn't even use it on my continuous integration server. So with that in mind, I initially wanted to participate on the project and uh, assist by uh, taking all the small bits, putting them back together, and making sure that it ran faster. Um, I failed in that regard. Uh, I tried to participate, but what actually happened was that I was unable to uh, interpret the code base in a proper way. Uh, so what does any young person do with too much time on their hands? Well, they build their own. So that's basically what I did. I built the success, uh, some sort of <coughs> successor, excuse me, uh, called DocBlocks. Perhaps some people might actually know the project. And DocBlocks was actually meant as a drop-in replacement. So for all intents and purposes, with the API, it was 100% compatible with the original. And after, I think it was one and a half, two years uh, in, in the, on the project, I was wondering, well, there has not been any uh, efforts on PHP Documents itself for almost three years. Why not propose a merger? And so it happened. I contacted Chuck Burgess, who was at that time the active developer on PHP Documenter, and said to him, well, I've got this, you've got that. Why not combine it into the best of both, a new architecture 
under the brand PHP document uh, with all the features of the original PHP document. Uh, and there we go, we had version two. That's that's pretty cool. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a neat story. So if, if it was started in 99 and then you took over in like 06 or 08, uh, PHP has come a huge way since then. Um, what has it been like having such a long-running project, um, you know, as, as the face of PHP changes? As um, I'm assuming that the code base, are you, have you been able to take advantage of some of the new features of PHP, or has it been pretty much the same? Well, we actually upgraded the code base quite a bit. As I said, DocBlocks was the predecessor of what is now PHP Documenta 2. And that was built from the ground up to use namespaces, all the PHP 5.3 features and everything. Um, the biggest challenge for us was actually to make sure that all the options and toggles and everything was backwards compatible all the way back, even though uh, it contained PHP 4 support. So you had a special tag uh, at final, you had a special tag at public, at protected, at private, because in prior to PHP 5, there were no visibility settings. So you weren't able to actually manage that in your source code. So what you mainly saw was that the functionality of PHP document had to change over time. Um, and we tried to go along with it. Uh, in the upcoming version, PHP document 3, which is under development, we're actually using several of the high-tech high PHP 5.5 features. Um, and also part of the new ecosystem, like uh, new types of dependency injection containers, CQRS, uh, a little bit of DDD mixed in between all those fancy buzzwords that you have nowadays. All right, so you're, you're taking advantage of the DDD. Um, everybody loves that. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, you're also a speaker, though, and you speak at a number of conferences. True, absolutely. Yeah. How long have you been speaking? Um, let me see. I actually started somewhere in 2009, I think, if I remember correctly. That was when Stefan Kopmoskop actually uh, pushed me to speaking. Uh, at the time, I was working at that internet service provider I was talking about before. And we uh, pulled in Stefan Kopmoskop uh, as another employee to assist with, with the project. And I was really tentative about I wanted to speak for quite some time. Uh, I saw the speakers and I was like, I want to share what I know. At least I think I know stuff, so why not share it with people? Well, I was actually too afraid to get on stage. I've got a bit of stage fright. I'm, I'm not the extrovert kind of guy. I'm more of like an introvert. But on the other hand, I like talking. So I like to share what I know with people. So it was Stefan and actually pushed me forward and gave me a little nudge to uh, propose for my first conference. Do you remember what the first conference was? Now I need to think back. It was either PHP Northwest or PF Congress in the Netherlands. Um, it always sounds, it's PF Congress. I remember now my first talk was about uh, Scrum, how you can implement that in your own organization. At that time, I was a scrum master for uh, ISP I was just talking about. OK, cool. So when you gave that first talk, I mean, you already mentioned that you had stage fright. So you know, were you very nervous going up on stage? I was absolutely mortified, actually. I was standing there in the room. Uh, I had index cards ready. Uh, I was literally trembling on my feet. And then the first people came in. One person came in. Two people came in, the third, the fifth, the tenth, the twentieth, up until I think there were about 100, person, 100 people present in total. Uh, I stood there trembling like, like a straw, just looking at those people and thinking, all right, but they have to listen to me. So I put up my in index cards because I was not sure of my presenting skills at the time. I did the talk, and after the first few words, it just uh, went flowing. It just kept on going, and I didn't think about the audience for a moment, except to gather some information from them about what their skills were. Well, that's that's cool. Um, so, 
you know, most times when you're talking about first time speakers, you know, um, a lot of times they'll talk too fast or, you know, fidgeting. Um, I think the first time I ever gave a talk, uh, I was wearing a hoodie and if you watch the video of that talk, I've got my hoodie strings the whole time and I'm like doing this with my hoodie strings because I was so nervous. So did you have any of that? That's actually a rather good question. Um, I'd have to really think hard about that actually. I probably have had some kind of tick, uh, probably talking too fast, but that's what I usually do actually. Um, and I might have fidgeted with my index cards. Uh, but I don't think the session was recorded. And if it was, I don't think I would have dared to watch it back. I, I still don't. A any recording, I don't watch them back because I, I'm too afraid of what I'm going to see. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't either. I don't. I don't understand the people that can do that because I cannot do that. I've never watched a recording of myself. Um, I normally don't even watch the recordings for no capes because, <laughs> again, you know, I'm on video and it's kind of painful to watch that. Um, do you think over the years that you've improved as a speaker? Um, yes. In certain regards, uh, I still don't have the hang of the whole uh, preparation thing, but I think it's more my style to actually go on stage, have several milestones during my talk, and uh, fill them up in between uh, to tell my story that I want to tell. Uh, I tried to do a full preparation once, and it didn't go well. <laughs> but, uh, it's not organic. It doesn't feel real. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't really got the hang of that. but the nerves have gone down. I'm not as mortified as I was before. I'm now just nervous. Do you have like a pre-talk ritual or anything you do to get yourself psyched up to go on stage? Um, actually, I don't psych up. I actually try to zen myself right before I go on stage. Uh, if possible, I try to be 10 minutes before my talks are in, in the room. And I love it when the room is still empty at that time. So I can sit in the front row and I wouldn't really say meditate, but it's rather similar. I close my eyes, I try to slow my, slow my breath for a moment, slow my heart rate, and uh, do a mental rerun for the last time. So when you talk about not doing full preparation for talks, do you, <clears throat> I mean, do you like rubber duck? Do you go through them a number of times? How, you know, what do you do to prepare for a talk? For me, the most important part is that I've got the story straight. And um, I do that by being as familiar as possible with the subject I'm going to be talking about. Preparing for a talk isn't for me preparing the actual talk, but getting all the domain knowledge that I need to do uh, a talk without having any aids. Um, if possible, I try to know as much about my topic and the milestones that I need to make so that I don't have to use slides, for example. That doesn't mean that everything between the milestones is properly prepared. In fact, it isn't, uh, for, for a given reason. But what happens is that I've got these set stones, these set milestones, and um, the point from A to B is something that should flow naturally for me. Um, it's a story that I've got in my head, but not as words, but more as a picture for example. So most of my preparation goes into making sure I know the domain. I know what I'm talking about. So resultantly, I would assume that no two talks of yours are the same. Like if you're giving the same talk at different conferences, do they vary a lot? Actually, they vary uh, quite a bit from time to time, um, though Usually I take my slides as a representation of my milestones and I can have uh, 40 to 60 slides during an entire talk. Well, if you try to uh, convert that to number of slides per minute, that's usually one slide every minute. So you try to talk one minute about the subject, that's actually rather easy and comes out in a similar way every time and then time again. Okay, that makes sense. So when you're talking about milestones, you have you know 40 to 60 of them, not like a few. I've got a few large milestones and those are subdivided into smaller steps as a, as a figure of speech. Okay, that makes sense. So 
Um, do you have a favorite talk that you've given? I think my favorite talk would, would have been the Scrum one. It's a lighthearted uh, talk that actually conveys my personal experiences on the topic. Um, and it will be terribly outdated by now. Uh, my ideal talk that I would like to give one time in the future would be about quality assurance. We had a quite extensive quality assurance process at one of my previous companies. And unfortunately, that talk has never been picked for a conference. So how do you come up with ideas for your talks? Is it just whatever you're passionate about at the time, or what do you, how do you do that? Actually, that's one of the hardest parts of the entire uh, talk, talk process, getting a subject, getting to know, trying to think of what you can talk about. Uh, I suffer from the fact that I think that everything I know is common knowledge. So I suffer from the fact that I want to think of a topic, but I can't think of one because well, everybody knows about that, don't they? Um, so what I try to do is take a step back and actually take a look at, all right, perhaps other people don't know what I know. Uh, which topics would they encounter in their daily life as a developer? Uh, continuous integration is an example of which I've gave a talk before. Uh, that's something which you encounter every day. Um, unit testing would be a subject I would love to talk about, but everybody does it already. Um, quality assurance is another example. You encounter that every day during your working life. Uh, and same goes for a Scrum process. Uh, documentation is also one of my favorite topics because actually no one talks about documentation. But then again, I'm the PHP documenter guy. <laughs> right, so yeah, the, the two main problems that I run into when trying to think of talks is A, everybody knows that, so I was talking about it. And, and B, that, well, there's going to be, there, there are so many people who know much more about this than I do, and I'm going to get up on stage, and then someone in the audience is going to be like, no, you're wrong, or I know more than you, or something. So that, those are the things that I encounter that kind of scare me when, when picking talk titles or, you know, subjects. Um, I think that falls probably under imposter syndrome somewhere in there. Yeah, um, it's around there, yeah. So how do you deal with, um, you know, if you submit to a CFP and you don't get picked, does that, does it bother you um, or do you just take it in stride? I think I just take it in stride. If it happens, I always try to picture that there are probably about 200 or 300 people who actually responded to a call for papers. Uh, most conferences, uh, some exceptions like Kung Fu, usually only have about 30 to 60 slots available. So yeah, they have to drop some subjects. Um, and if it's an overseas conference, for example, if it's in America, uh, the chances that I'm being picked is, are rather slim because America has got a fair number of speakers that are, uh, are much cheaper to house than I am. And to be fair, that's for a conference, that's a big deal, that they have to pay for the speakers to come over and they only have a budget for so many. That makes sense. It's a, it's a good way to look at it. Um, so let's see. Um, do you have something that always kind of scares me and worries me about talks is the Q&A afterhand? Because mm -hmm. there's really no way to prepare for that. Um, is that something that you are also like trepidatious about? Or like how do you feel about Q&A? Actually, I love the Q&A part. Um, as I said, I try to gather as much domain knowledge as I can beforehand, and I really dive into the topic that I want to talk about. So the QA is actually sometimes a refreshing moment for me to view points from a different perspective. Um, if someone asks a question, they might as well ask something I don't know about yet. And if I don't know, that's a good reason for me to investigate. Uh, my most dreaded Q&A sessions are the ones where people don't ask questions. Uh, this one time I gave a design talk, and I mean visual design and not uh, architectural design, on a DPC, and it went, it was so bad. It, it was horrific, actually. Uh, due to some technical difficulties, my nerves that really got up to here 
due to those difficulties, and at the end, nobody was asking questions while I had 15 minutes to spare. So what did you do in that situation? Well, uh, I tried to uh, pull some questions from the audience by asking enticing questions in return, uh, by making statements to which I hope they respond. But in the end, if they don't respond, well, I'm afraid that there's no other chance that the only thing you can do is say, oh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, have a nice conference. That makes sense. You just, you know, give them a little bit longer break, I guess. Um, have you ever run, like, short on a talk? Uh, well, that talk was actually an example that I ran short because uh, I had too much nerves. Um, due to the technical difficulties, I was completely thrown off guard and uh, ran through the topic, forgot parts of my talk, uh, so I ran short that time. Um, but most of the time, I really have to watch the clock. I always have my iPad running with a timer that's telling me how many minutes I've got left. Um, and I usually tell my talks that every milestone should be at that minute. So I end up at the right amount of time. That's a, that's a pretty smart way to do it. If you have 60 slides in 60 minutes, then you just do one a minute. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so when you're designing a slide deck, um, mm -hmm. my I usually attempt to make it like as simple as possible because I don't really want fancy slides. Um, do you have a certain methodology to doing to designing your slides? Um, for me, the most important thing about my slides, and uh, this sounds a bit awkward, is that they are nice to look at. Um, I have been to too many talks where the slide deck was um, technical, was a bit bland, and while the contents were great, I was actually distracted by the slide deck uh, because I tend to look at it from a point of view of, of if those parts have been tweaked, I would have understood it better. Um, or slide decks where you can see uh, eight bullet points filtered to the brim with information uh, well, I finished reading before the person who was talking about that slide is actually finished talking, meaning that I uh, get distracted because I don't have any reason to listen to that person any longer. So what I try to do is uh, take a minimalist approach, usually a word, uh, a small catchphrase, and something nice to look at to keep people interested. And uh, one of my hallmarks is also to include what I like to call a bridge. But as in music, you've got a bridge where there's a moment that the music changes completely. Uh, I do the same thing with slide decks. Somewhere in the middle, there's usually a picture of a kitten. OK. That's good. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a kitten in a slide deck, but I'm kind of sad that I haven't. Um, so I read this, this uh, I think it's called like speaker.io or something, speaking.io, um, that, like, it, it talks about how to design slides and how to speak and all that stuff, and it was pretty helpful for me. Anyone who's watching, if you haven't seen it, you should probably go check it out because it's a good resource. Um, but one of the slide deck um, tips that it gives is to change the color of your slides um, during important times. So it kind of mm -hmm. falls under the thing you're talking about with milestones, like you have the big ones and then steps in between. So for the big milestones, those should be a different color. Yeah. Do you do that? Uh, yes, I try to apply similar uh, techn uh, techniques. Um, I personally have read the book Slideology. Um, if anybody is interested in speaking, I can definitely recommend that book uh, as it tries to explain a lot of concepts behind the psychology of yeah, building great slides. Um, and they also like to talk about color by using proper color for highlighting to ensure that certain words are actually uh, calling to the mind. And when you're talking about marking a big milestone with a completely different color, um, that's a rather similar to what you would do with web design, when you use a call to action, a specific red button that just flashes right in your face, so you have to click on that. Same goes for the great milestones. You have to look on that just to know where we are. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, it, it works well for me, and and you know, 
looking at the slide deck when you're up on stage, being able to see those drastically different colored slides kind of gives me uh, like a feeling of where I am. Um, like it, it just anchors me, I guess. So I find it helpful. Um, so in general, um, do you submit to every CFP that opens or, you know, how do you choose which conferences you're going to submit to? Uh, that's actually another hard part about submitting, where to submit to and where not. I try to look at how many conferences there are on the same period of time. Um, I once did two conferences that were almost back to back to each other. There was just one or two weeks in between. Um, I know some people actually can do that, but I'm not going to do that ever again. Um, it, it takes me quite a bit of time to prepare for my slides and to prepare for my talk, especially when I'm giving a new one. Uh, I need at least a month to prepare a talk and uh, to prepare for a conference. So I try to look at the timing. Where are they situated? And I try to focus on West, the Western of Europe because I know that I'm more commonly accepted there as a speaker. Um, and I try to submit to some American conferences, but mainly the ones that I'm personally interested in. Uh, for example, PHP Tech. It's got a it's got a great atmosphere, so as far as I've heard. Um, and ZenCon is also one of those conferences that I probably won't feel comfortable being at, but is uh, a bit of a bucket list thing. Why do you say you wouldn't feel comfortable being there? Um, I can feel I can feel quite uncomfortable with large amounts of people surrounding me, and uh, given that ZenCon usually has what was the last count? Something like a few thousand people present. Um, I don't think I really feel comfortable because there are too many people around me. I, I need to flee every once in a while just to get some personal space, as a matter of speaking. Yeah, I, I, I know a lot of people that do that. I personally will go hang out in my hotel room for a couple hours just to kind of decompress because large crowds are very tiring for me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I want to kind of switch, uh, switch it up a little bit. Um, you're also a member of the FIG. Um, Indeed. So how did how did that come about? How did you get involved? When did you get involved, and why? Oh well, mm -hmm. uh, initially I got involved because I was just visiting the mailing list and reading along, uh, and I had some ideas about how things would work. Um, uh, being a bit of a documentation guy. I also had an opinion on how the PSRs were written. Uh, for example, I've helped with, write PSR 4 um, and tried to add some structure, at least to what made sense in my mind. And in the end, I started writing a, uh, well, an initial draft for the PHP doc structure, as you can call it, which tags there are, how the syntax works, and at a given point, someone said, I, why not make a PSR out of that one? And I was like, well, why not, actually? And then someone said to me, and it was actually Matthew Wyofini, I think, he said, why not join the FIG? I think you can do real, a good there. So at first I was hesitant because, well, PHP documented, it's not, a, it's not a big framework. It's got a large user base in terms of projects, but it has got a large user base in the sense of developers. Uh, it, it's a tool, like PHP unit, for example. So I didn't feel like I was fitting in. I was in place with the rest of the, of the group. Uh, and then I think Matthew persuaded me in the end, and I, and I submitted. And everybody was, yay, come, join us. So that's basically how it went. Cool. So um, since joining, um, what has been like your experience? I mean, the, the FIG has done a lot of good, I think, for PHP, and we continue to do a lot of good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what's it like to be a member of the FIG, I guess is what I'm asking. Oh, well, uh, one of the most interesting things about being a member of the FIG is that people uh, more or less underestimate the role of the FIG, of FIG within the current ecosystem of PHP. Um, for example, Composer as a project has had an immense impact on how we develop nowadays. But part of how Composer works and why it is successful is actually because of PSR 0, the first and initial PSR written way back at PHP Tech, I think, if I remember correctly. 
Um, so yeah, PHP Fig has had a severe impact on how we work nowadays. Um, PSA 1 and 2 are another example of that. And it's also the most contentious example because people either hate it or love it, as it seems. Uh, I've seen PSA 2 forked, I think, three, four times now. Uh, with a minor tweak here, minor tweak there, uh, naming it the same, so we get a lot of confusion going on. But in the end, what you can see is that a lot of projects are actually adopting these standards. And it helps me, at least, to write consistent code, to find my way in a new code base. If a code base uses one of the PSRs, I know where to look, I know where to navigate to. Uh, if I want to submit a pull request, I don't have to think about, oh, wait, what what wrong or strange uh, standard will this project use? Sh must I use tabs? Must I use spaces? Uh, where does the brace go? Must there be a space between uh, the, op the equals operator or anything? It, it takes a lot of the mental strain away from assisting and uh, working with other projects. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, PSR2 is huge. Uh, I use PSR4 for namespace stuff, not a loading. Um, so yeah, I think I, I agree with you. Um, it's had a huge impact on you know, how we work and how we develop. And uh, a lot of people probably don't take that into consideration a lot of times. Um, now, people tend to think of PHP Fig as an elitist group of people. Um, who sit on top of an ivory throne and just go like, oh wait, I think we feel like doing this today. Uh, well, that's not how it works. Uh, if people were to look at how FIG operates, part of what yeah, some might see as sluggishness or um, a lot of fiddling between members is actually making sure that we're on the same page. And if we as projects are on the same page, then people can choose to adopt that pace that, that we set out and makes it easier to do the whole interpretation thing. It, it's not a matter of we look at, oh wait, we're going to do this. Uh, an example again for piece uh, one and two. There was actually a list compiled of all the, the coding standard things that the projects had in common. We didn't invent something, we brought something together in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's pretty powerful, I guess, because you have a lot of great minds trying to solve some problems. Um, and I, I don't think that any PSR is going to be like 100% necessarily what one of those people want. Um, you know, there's some give and take and compromise, and really it's about creating a standard that is the best possible standard for everybody, I guess. Um, so I, I think that's a really good thing. And um, it would be a completely different story if it was, you know, a couple people that were just kind of dic dictator-ish, dictatorial. I don't know what that word is. Um, <laughs> you know, but if they were just imposing their will. No, it's, it's you know, a few dozen people that all, you know, have a say and weigh in and uh, really just looking for the best solution for everyone. Um, I tend to think so, at least. Yeah. I mean, I'm... Happy with it. Um, and yeah, PSR 7 also is a, a huge PSR um, that I think is going to really change a lot of things. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, OK, so um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, because we have about 15 minutes, um, is uh, mental health. So I do a lot of talking about mental health and some of the experiences that I encounter. Um, from being bipolar, um, and you um, talk about you know your own mental health, and you're pretty open with that. So, um, can you explain a little bit about you know what it is that you've been diagnosed with, and and how that affects your life as a developer? Well, um, to get down to the diagnosis and the technical stuff, I've officially been diagnosed with uh, syndrome of Asperger, Asperger's syndrome. Um, and interestingly enough, it has had, uh, for me, a positive experience on how I go about in life. Uh, it's also strange for, um, well, for example, being around a lot of people is actually a big strain for me as 
um, I get oversensitive. Uh, all, all those, all that input is making my brain go haywire through at a given point in time. So I really need to draw, go back and recharge before I can go back into a social setting. Um, but with regards to being able to do my work, I actually find it to be an advantage. And there are, at least in my direct environment, a lot of people who understand that it's not a problem. It's, it's a label. It's something that you might be. But as long as you're a nice guy, yeah, who cares, actually? I wonder if that's <clears throat> cultural or, or what is... Um, I know, for me anyway, I feel a lot of stigma, um, you know, just bad connotations around you know, mental health. Is, is that like an American thing? Do you guys not have that in the Netherlands? I'm sure we've got stigmas. Um, I think that, for example, in your case, bipolar would have a more severe impact than someone saying, hey, I'm autistic. Uh, for some reason, uh, being autistic has achieved some kind of IT status. Um, I've had several employers say to me that all proper ITs are autistic. Um, and that's actually a mentality I encounter um, every once in a while. I haven't worked for a really large organizations such as uh, big banks or anything. They might be a little bit more, um, how to put it, um, restraint when it comes to such thought. Uh, but I do think that there's also a cultural influence. Uh, well, most people would know I'm Dutch, and Dutch people are generally direct in their communication. Um, most people would just say blunt, but I say direct. <laughs> Same so thing. I so think, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I think that helps, uh, that there's some sort of no-nonsense thing about it. As long as you do your work, as long as you're a good guy to hang out with, uh, sure, you've got that label, but I'm not really bothered by it, so what's the issue? I, I think it's got, got that of no-nonsense mentality associated with it. That's really good. I wish we had more of that here. Um, so are you pretty open with telling people about, um, like, about your diagnosis? Yeah, I don't make a secret out of it. Um, I generally don't announce it to the public, but even on Twitter, I uh, occasionally tweet about Autism Day, and uh, if there's a large breakthrough on that part, um, it's not a secret. It's something, it's part of me. It's something who I am um, and what I will always be. And I don't try to, I don't try to hide myself as much as, you know, some might uh, or as some might feel comfortable with. That's, I mean, that's really good, and I think it's healthy. Um, for me, uh, you know, I started Hack the Stigma about a year ago, I think, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so I, I tweet pretty frequently about having bipolar and taking my medicine and, you know, those sorts of things. And it's, it's actually been really difficult. It's hard for me to do that because I've lived so long with the, the stigma of, oh, you're crazy or, oh, you're unstable or that's bad or it's all in your head. Um, which obviously, yes, it is all in my head because that's, you know, where your brain is. But um, it, it's definitely been difficult for me. Um, so that you, that thing you said about um, all proper ITers are, have Asperger's? Well, um, our autist, uh, usually people use the general autist right. term when they talk about it, actually. So how do you feel about that? Like, if, you know, someone says that to you, how did that make you feel? Seems like a very odd thing to say. Um, well, given the context, I, I can imagine that people would say because, well, the artist, the classical artist, as people know it, is focused uh, rather strong in, on, on the logic part. And uh, for some reason, people always try to compare famous people with uh, Asperger's, for example. Uh, everybody knows Bill Gates has Asperger's, except he probably himself. <laughs> but um, that's something which you see go around a lot, and whenever I hear someone say all proper ITs are artists, I uh, chuckle a little bit, and um, uh, for on one side I feel honored, on the other side I feel like, yeah, there's more to it. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not going to discuss that in detail with them, but that sounds rude to me. 
right? So, excuse me. Did you have anyone in your life, you know, prior to being diagnosed with Asperger's, did you have anyone in your life um, that, you know, was also um, had Asperger's or other mental health issues? No? Uh, well, um, I've actually had several people in my direct, in my direct environment that had health issues, uh, mental health issues, um, went to see psychologists, uh, Used, used, uses or have used medicine to try to get a grip on their situation. Um, so yeah, I have had several encounters with them and it's actually partly due to those people that I went to investigate my own mental health situation. That's, that's good. I think the best thing we can do is uh, encourage people to help themselves or, or to get help. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about what you do to, to treat um, Asperger's? Um, mainly it's, for me, it's mainly about accepting. Um, you have to accept things like uh, you can't go to every social event. Even if you would want to, you can't because you've got a limited amount of, well, sometimes people call spoons, and that's a measurement for your energy uh, to spend. Um, I am limited to having a social engagement for actually at most two to three times per week, uh, aside from work. Um, I'm in the unfortunate position that I have to tell friends every once in a while that I have to cancel an appointment because I'm not feeling well. So it's mainly about accepting that you come with limitations, um, but also embracing that those limitations also bring a kind of strength to you. Uh, my logic reasoning ability is something which I dedicate and attribute to my Asperger's and is something which I'm thankful for. My problem with reading people's emotions and reading people's um, nonverbal signals is a limitation that I have to work with. And that is something which can make me feel uncomfortable every once in a while because sometimes you just don't know what somebody is trying to convey as a message. But again, you have to accept that because just that's the way how it is. So how long ago um, were you diagnosed? Uh, my diagnosis was, um, let me see, 13 years ago, uh, 12, 13 years ago, somewhere around that time, actually. So, you know, the biggest thing, as you're saying, is, is accepting this. Um, was that acceptance easy for you to come by once you were diagnosed, or was it something that, that took time? It did take a lot of time. Um, originally, I um, went into the process of going through the diagnosis because I had a burnout. Um, and while talking to uh, the psychiatrist, we actually discovered that there was more at stake. So after going through the diagnosis process, you end up with, congratulations, you've got Asperger's. And then the real work starts. And that's the part where you have to learn to come to terms with what you can and can't do. Uh, but also try to gain strength from those things that are your strengths. And that you have to see what you can do instead of what you can't do. And uh, even to this day, I still haven't fully figured out how to do that properly, but I'm still on the road. I'm still working on it, and I will get there eventually. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a process. Um, so, so I guess, um, do you do, or I guess, did you um, do continue on with the talk therapy um, and seeing a psychiatrist and, and going through that? Um, I think I spent uh, between one and two years seeing the psychiatrist and that actually ended because he quit his job. Not, not thanks to me, but just, just to be fair. <laughs> okay, and, and you didn't um, continue on with another um, practitioner? No, that's where sometimes things go wrong. 
if I lose contact, I can uh, find it really hard to regain contact. Uh, same goes for uh, help, like in this case. Um, there was no initiative from the organization that provided the psychiatrist to actually continue, and they left me to my own devices, and that's probably the worst thing they can do. Yeah. Um, do you think you found, you know, for the one or two years that you were going, did you find it helpful um, to have someone mm. like that? Um, partly. You, you really have to meet the right person to get the most out of, well, a treatment sounds a bit the wrong word, but a most out of therapy. Um, some psychiatrists actually have the tendency to hold your hand and go with you through the process. For me, it was the most helpful when they actually uh, confronted me with uh, behavior, with uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm doing, how I'm thinking. Um, where they actually uh, encouraged me to think about what I'm doing instead of giving an acknowledgement and encouragement. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so did you see a number of, of psychiatrists during that time, or was it just one guy who changed his um, methods throughout the period? Um, no, I've only seen that one person at the time, um, but I've heard many stories from around me when it comes to the you know, several variations that you have. Okay. Um, cool. Is there anything, you know, if somebody, um, I don't know, suspects or someone has, is struggling with some problems, is there anything that you would tell them, advice? Yeah, my, my best advice would be uh, find your strength and focus on what makes you strong and not what makes you weak. That's good advice. Um, so we're running just right up on time. Um, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you want to talk about? Actually, uh, nothing that I can think of at the moment. We've covered a whole range of subjects, and uh, the last part was a little bit scary, to be honest, but uh, I think it's good that mental health should be a topic that people can talk about and want to talk about. Um, I have recognized that in America it's harder for someone to actually talk about their mental health issues because there's a different type of mentality over there. And I hope that being able to talk about such things is changing the environment, is changing the setting. So yeah, I think it's awesome. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate you doing that. I understand the, the scariness of it. Um, you know, mental health is a passion of mine, and you're actually the first person who I've had on that I've been able to talk about that with. So, uh, yeah, bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, and, and hopefully anyone watching this um, got something out of that, because it is a very important topic that we should be talking about more. I agree. I fully agree. So um, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a joy, and I'm glad, uh, you know, you and I had know each other kind of in a cursory capacity so it was nice to get to get to know you um, and your story and yeah thank you very much likewise and thank you for having me yeah and for everyone who's watching thank you too and have a good Saturday likewise have a good Saturday